Thank you very much, and thank you, the Bertarelli Foundation, for making this happen. Um, I'm from Stanford University. I want to acknowledge also the other institutions working closely with me, like the ZSL and the Global Fishing Watch. And um, I wanted to share with you a last uh, one of the, uh, a recent paper we published about the, the role of large marine protected area and how, and, and shark based lines. And, um, the question I want to start with is, how should a pristine coral reef ecosystem look? At this time, we don't know yet. We don't know how a natural ecosystem should look like, and this is very difficult. It is difficult because this is a, this is a paper that came out in Science in 2008 and shows that there is very little, uh, if any, uh, sector of the ocean that are not impacted by human, uh, by human footprint. And if you take one of the most successful uh, approach to uh, answer this question, which is the historical approach, there is yet a lot, of, a lot of sector, in a lot of sector, humans have been exploiting these areas for much longer than we could record with scientific uh, data. But we can, do, uh, we can take a mix, uh, mixed approach so we can take uh, our uh, affected, uh, threatened ecosystem and look at gradients of these, uh, of these impact and, and by looking at how the ecosystem changes across gradients of human footprints, we can come out with the insight about how, how a pristine ecosystem should look like. And in fact, in the last decades, people have been looking around for very far coral archipelagos that are devoid of human presence and, and trying to understand how the ecosystem should look like in this area. And what they found in this area is that uh, usually sharks are very abundant. And so these abundance of sharks even produce density estimate of 200,000 sharks per square kilometers, astronomical uh, numbers, to the point that people started to question uh, conventional tenets of ecology, saying that uh, a conventional community is a, is a structure with a lot more prey, uh, less consumer, and less, and less predators. And then start postulating the, uh, the idea of the inverted tropic pyramids, where there is much more predators than prey. And, and they were start thinking, maybe marine ecosystems are looking like uh, are structured in a inverted pyramids. When you look at these, uh, these uh, cases, however, you see that, uh, and also when you take into account microecology and the energy flows from one component to another, these ecosystems are making little sense in most of the time. Also, uh, there are, a lot, of uh, there are a, lot a lot of census biases, meaning that people were overestimating density uh, because of their, uh, the techniques that they were used. And in these cases of overabundance of sharks may be the fact that people were looking had some particular location or episodic events or seasonal events or, or to uh, shark population that were uh, uh, channeling energy from elsewhere. So in reality, the ecosystem should have been much more uh, uh, larger. However, if, even if we assume that our natural ecosystem should be constituted by a lot of, a lot of sharks, there is another problem. These, uh, this is a, a report we just published in Science uh, a few months ago. Uh, for the first time, we came out with uh, an independent fishery, um, um, fishery estimate, estimate of uh, the, the global footprint of fishing from satellite data. A lot of uh, large boats use uh, AIS, which is uh, an anti-collision uh, satellite beacon that can transmit the position of a boat uh, in a very uh, short period of time. Taking all these billions of data points from, from these uh, satellite provider, we could come out with a, with a map for the first time saying that uh, most of the ocean is actually exploited. There are a few areas that are free from industrial fishing. This is just uh, um, high seas fishing. Uh, it doesn't count, um, it's not uh, coastal fishing, which usually don't use these devices, do not use a uh, vessel uh, tracking system, but should be more intense in, uh, in coastal areas. And if you look at Longline, which is the biggest, uh, um, the biggest uh, um, uh, fishing fleet in the planet, you see that even in area like the Chagos Archipelago, that it's, uh, that where these international fishing fleet cannot go, they are all around the area. And for decades, the longline fishing fleet have been exploiting tunas, bill fishing, and sharks increasingly over time. And they have, they are, they have affected the community. So they have uh, calling these pelagic ecosystems from, uh, from predators. 
And this may have an effect also in coral reef uh, ecosystem, like here, like uh, big sharks, like hammerheads or oceanic white tip. So what best place, like uh, a better place than Chagos to chase baselines, to look for baseline? The Chagos archipelago is part of the Indian Ocean, uh, of the British, um, the British Indian Ocean Territory, 600,000 square kilometer, containing one of the most pristine uh, coral reef ecosystems uh, on the planet. Human footprint in the area has been apparently low since uh, the settlement in the mid-1800. Uh, there has been only 1,400 um, uh, coconut plantation workers. And then after the area transitioned from, uh, from the colonial government of Mauritius to the direct jurisdiction of, of, uh, of the UK, um, only 2,400 people are living, uh, 4,000 people are living in Diego Garcia, not really, uh, mostly involved with the, with the base. Um, so here, uh, from uh, Nick, um, uh, Nick work, um, uh, in the 70s, they were the first uh, scientific expedition surveying uh, with the scuba diving, uh, doing scuba diving surveys. And they were seeing that in the 70s, uh, people were actually seeing a lot of sharks. Anecdotal information suggested that these were mostly uh, silver tip sharks. There were 10, 10 to 5 t silver tip sharks for every uh, gray reef shark encounter. But over time, in 30 years, these, uh, these uh, abundance declined uh, by 90%. And then after the establishment of the marine protected areas in 2010, they, they, they saw a slow recovery. One problem with this data is that it's very valuable, but it doesn't, in, in the early surveys, we don't know any information about community composition in, in the area. And the declines of these sharks it seems to do the fact that in the Chagos archipelago there is a lot of illegal fishing for sharks. Uh, previous estimates suggested, uh, a rough estimate suggested between 4,000 and 26,000 sharks per year were fished in the area. Uh, from 30 to 200 fishing vessels incurring from Sri Lanka, uh, mostly from Sri Lanka, every, every year fishing with long line drift nets, uh, targeting especially sharks because they are very valuable for, for their, their fins. And, and, and so we, we use this data, we, we wanted to, but um, we wanted to take, uh, so now we have this data, these sharks, but we don't know, we don't know yet. Um, it would be great if we could actually come out with, uh, um, with changes in the community, changes in the community, species specific changes in the community. We didn't know species specific trend. So what we did for this, uh, for this work was taking a more overarching and historical and integrative approach where we used, um, where we reconstructed the history of exploitation in the area and then combined with this reconstruction with seizure reports every once in a while the, um, the patrolling boat in the area can intercept these fishers and can record all the catches that we're doing, scuba diving surveys, fisheries data, uh, historical scientific surveys, and also uh, macroecological theory to come out with baseline of, uh, of uh, coral reef sharks uh, in the area. And we focus in, in with two species, the two most abundant uh, reef, sh uh, reef shark species in the area, which are the gray reef and the silver tip sharks. These have, uh, have a similar ecology, but not identical. They are also differently vulnerable to fishing. So their long-term change over time could be very insightful to understand how the community of sharks changes as there are multiple threats uh, in this area. So we use conventional stock assessment models called the surplus production model in a Bayesian and a, and a state space model approach. We use the Bayesian and state space model approach because we could use data, multiple data sets, and we could use also border of strength from data from, from elsewhere. And basically the, pro, the surplus production model is a, sim, is a simple logistic, fun, logistic population function where simply put, the, the abundance of the population this year is related to the population next year, is all, uh, the previous year, is also related to how much uh, the productivity of the species, so the maximum uh, population growth rate of the species, how many individuals can the ecosystem uh, sustain, uh, we call the carrying capacity, and how many individuals are taken out with catches every, every year. So if, if we rearrange arithmetically this, uh, this uh, uh, equation, we can conveniently um, 
fit this model with by using a long-term index of abundance time series, and, and the best time series is the scuba diving survey that has been done since the 70s in the area. Um, a time series of catches we get, which we can reconstruct from different uh, data sets, and also prior information of how much we think these catches relate to the population. Um, the maximum growth rate uh, how, from life histories, uh, a prior of, uh, of, of the max population growth rate, and also current capacity also estimated uh, from the data. So we took the data from uh, seizure reports, from the seizure report from 2006 to 2015. Uh, we could understand that the illegal fishers were taking a lot of sharks, 20 sharks from Pelagic to Gora Reef sharks. The most abundance were silver tip and gray reef sharks. And, um, and, and this was very useful to, uh, to reconstruct the catches, especially in recent, in recent time. We also used a tre an historical treasure uh, long-line surveys done by the Soviet Union in the 60s, 70s, and in the 80s. We looked especially for areas around the Chagos Archipelago and, uh, and uh, around the Kora Reef to predict uh, composi species composition in the, in the 70s to try to disaggregate the scuba diving surveys. We also took uh, borrowing strength from other data, from other system, 46 estimates of baseline densities of sharks taken from 46 archipelagos in the Pacific Ocean. And so we expected from this analysis that we should expect uh, about 171 sharks per square kilometers. We use a very interesting historical survey data done in the 48 and 49 by the British colonial government uh, around different archipelagos, including the Chagos Archipelago. In this surveys, we understood actually the most abundant shark species in the, in the, in the area was not silver tip sharks, but, uh, but by large gray reef sharks and then uh, silver tip sharks. And also we use, also we came out with other estimates of communicative composition from macroecological theories. From the body size of sharks, we could, we could estimate or try to predict their community composition from, from um, parameters of the, of the marine communities taken from other, from other systems. So, from a, so we took parameters uh, from a, a review, a global review of different marine communities for the traffic efficiency, so how much energy goes from one level to the next, and predator-prey mass ratio, so the difference in size between predators and prey. So we, we um, uh, fit these models and we came out with, uh, with another community composition. All this data put together in this Bayesian framework helped us to refine and to disaggregate in species-specific trends the, the surveys, the, the scuba diving surveys, which suggested that sharks indeed declined by, by more than 75%. When you look at the species, while the silver tip shark declined very steeply, the gray reef were going through a steady, um, a steady increase. The model also was very informative to estimate more robust estimates of catches, from, uh, from uh, the, uh, the legal fishing. Uh, here in this plot, you see different uh, solid lines and ribbons are estimated catches from the data, and dashed, dashed line are uh, our prediction of how many catches we may have missed uh, and we may have uh, failed to, the, uh, to, uh, to collect. And so it says that in recent times, in the 90s, since the 90s, the previous estimates of catches of sharks in the area were fairly uh, ac accurate, but there were orders of magnitude uh, higher shark catches that we didn't, uh, we didn't account in the, previous, uh, in the previous decades, especially from, from long-line fishing. When you look at, uh, at in, uh, in synthesis at the, at the trends, long-term trends of this population, you see that uh, in baselines, we predicted there were much more gray reef sharks than, than silver tip shark. They went through uh, complementary uh, trajectories of change None of these species were at baseline conditions in the 70s. A great shark, uh, silver tip was at 79% of the baseline uh, level, and a great reef shark at 30, 13%, while the silver tip declined very steeply, the great reef shark increased uh, quite steadily. And we um, uh, explain these uh, trajectories by looking at the historical, uh, uh, at the history of exploitation in the areas, and we identified three main uh, periods. 
Uh, first periods, uh, uh, an inshore fishing period was mainly characterized by subsistence fishing by the, Chagos, uh, by the, by the uh, people working in the plantations. They were definitely working on the, on the plantation, uh, coconut plantation, but they were also using sea life for their subsistence. And also there was, uh, there was uh, in the 40s, uh, there were, uh, through the 90s, there, were, um, there was also a, Chag um, a Mauritian bank fisheries that was fishing uh, in, the, in the area. These, these, uh, this stage must have affected more the gray reef sharks, which is more residential, than the silver tip sharks, which can escape in, uh, in pelagic water. Then, since the 60s, in the Indian Ocean, it really developed the, the longline fishing fleet and increasingly targeting sharks. And in this phase, we predict that the silver tip sharks must have been more vulnerable because, uh, because it's more pelagic behavior than the gray reef sharks, and also a lower uh, resilience to fishing. And then, uh, since the 90s, uh, there is a conservation period where the, bi the BioT increased fisheries management to the, to, the, to the point of closing also the area in 2010. And these stages must have, have benefited more the gray reef shark, which is more residential, than the, than the silver tips, which can expose itself more to outside uh, fisheries. So one thing that we couldn't test is actually what, what is the effect of the, of the long line effects around the, the Chagos archipelago. And that's what we are doing with the analyzing uh, the entire Soviet uh, long line surveys. We are combining this data across, so we are analyzing it across the Indian Ocean. We are also combining, the, uh, combining this data with more recent, recent information. And what, what is telling, this data is telling us that, uh, first of all, there is, a, uh, there is a long list of species that were exploited, but even 30 years ago, there were some big predators that were increasing, and some other big predators that were, that were declining. So the, the community must have changed decades ago, and this may have had an effect on the, on the community. These results are also useful to develop a, a practical solution for conservation. This is, a, this is a picture of the previous patrolling boat, the Pacific Marlin. Um, with the data I had, this uh, these, uh, uh, patrolling boat had an efficiency of detection of illegal fishing of 10%, 10 meaning every 10 fishing boats coming in the area, one was arrested or was intercepted, and had a running cost of about 2.26 million pounds per year. So now we want to see whether in the Chagos we can actually de uh, um, deploy our uh, barb introduced this innovation. So in our lab we are working in uh, developing this really tiny tag that can be implanted in a shark. And as the shark is taken out of the water, it can transmit the position of, the position of this illegal catch in, uh, now we are shooting for 15 seconds actually, not, not 30 seconds. Once uh, this positional data is transmitted, then the, the, uh, this is communicated to the enforcement agents. We uh, predicted with mark recapture data that with the level of, uh, of silver tip sharks, for example, and the level of fishing, we can deploy less than 100 uh, tags. Here uh, we predict 83 tags to have the same, uh, um, um, uh, in the, uh, the same monitoring efficiency of the, of the patrolling boat. Another vision we had is putting 25 uh, drones, uh, autonomous, cheap, expendable drones that can, have a, that can use optimal search to identify fishing, fishing boats. They have an onboard capability to run machine learning and computer vision to recognize, uh, um, to recognize uh, fishing boats. So they can, they, can, they can identify intruders and, and communicate uh, in, identify intruders and also can be associated with the FAST system. So whenever a catch, an illegal catch is detected, the FAST can transmit the position to the satellite, which transmit the position to the, the drone. The drone goes to the, log, to the location of the, uh, of, the, of the catch and takes intelligence and collect intelligence. And then send this intelligence to, the, to Diego Garcia, which can, uh, can then plan monitoring or enforcement strategies. And with this, I wanted to thank you, all my collaborators for this, uh, for this work and uh, your attention. Thank you very much. <laughs>